This free presentation is brought to you by Quantum University. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, really thankful for, uh, for this amazing opportunity of uh, sharing what is really going on, I think, around the globe. And I believe that we are all blessed uh, because uh, for some reason, God has chosen us to lead this new path for health, right? Somehow, I, I believe that every one of us uh, were looking for this path, like forever. That's why we've been like uh, moving from one field to another. It is uh, very common that everybody will ask you, how come you are doing this? If you were an MD and dentist and architect and whatever you are, probably I think that the Lord chosen us, not we, not us to Him. Well, uh, right now I am trying to to shrink in a 30-minute presentation what I'd like to share with you in a few days or probably a couple of months. All right. So this is going to be actually a teaser. Um, this is uh, the natural pain self-management with laser technology and protocols. And Vienna will be talking about more uh, a variety, actually, to therapies in order to control pain. Um, this is the first time I'm using only, not only DDS, but IMD and PhD, because I'm graduating this coming Sunday, which is awesome for myself. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank Congratulations. You so much. Thank you so much. Well. Uh, I hope that we will have t enough time afterwards to discuss uh, and uh, let, I, I'm, I'll try to answer all your, your questions. Let's talk uh, about pain. It's a, a response to nociceptive stimuli. We can say that it is the, dri the driving uh, cause to, for sick treatment, right? Pain is what is going to move us. Um, Physical pain produces physiological depression, and both of them are difficult to measure. Uh, let's say $100 billion in lost, producti lost productivity, lost income, and healthcare expenditures. 40 to 50 million people suffering this condition. These numbers are for one year, a year in the States. 20 to 50 percent of elder adults live with chronic pain. This is huge. If we are talking about a population uh, suffering from pain or from any condition, pain is the main reason to look for. And if we are talking about chronic pain, how I see pain is if uh, there is any cause for acute pain and you cannot control it, it's going to become chronic pain. And then you start taking pills or medication or whatever to get rid of that pain, right? It means that we have failed to control pain. So what's going on right now? Your doctor is going to uh, prescribe you opi op opioids, for, for instance, to take care of that. And not for a weekend, but for weeks and then months. These drugs were designed to be taken for a few days, three or four days. But if you take that for one week, how about two weeks or months? If you only read what's inside the box of the opioids, all right, everything, you, can, you will read like uh, threatening. Your liver, liver will explode, your kidneys, your everything, and it happens. How about this? Opioids. In a four-week study, pain intensity decreased 30%. Side effects, constipation, 41%, nausea, 32%. Somnolence, 29%, uh, depression. Listen, four out of five individuals initiating heroin use reports starting with a prescription opioid. 2014, more than 19,000 deaths reported secondary to overdose with opioid. That's one year. More than in a war here in the States. Something is really wrong. Let's talk a little bit about history of laser. I'll, I'll try to really shrink that this amount of information, right? 
let's say that uh, started in 1900, something magical happened, in, happened right? Do you uh, concur? In 1900s, many things happened in this world. Let's say that uh, Max Planck, uh, Young, then uh, Albert Einstein, they were talking about uh, measuring, and eventually they tried to measure atoms. And there is where quantum physics starts, when you're trying to measure atoms. Because atoms will not behave like anything macro-structured. Everything is made out of atoms, yet they behave in a different way, all right? So um, I, I, I need to talk about the double slit experiment. Let's spend a couple of minutes with that, because I feel that in that moment, a physicist need to make a decision, either he's going to stay with uh, Newtonian physics or quantum physics. This is the very important thing. If one, I, I just need to know how many in the audience know about the double slit experiment? We all should know, right? Let's then talk really quick about that. If one photon, which is a particle, right, goes through two slits, it should, uh, from a Newtonian point of view, it should have two markings on the sensors, right, because our particles, like marbles, that are going through this slit. But somehow, it behaves like a wave with an interference pattern. This is like a miracle to me, all right? A particle of light can behave as a wave or as a particle, or as a physical particle. It's either energy or matter. And the wonderful thing is that it depends on the observer. You remember? If I am observing this, then something else is going to happen. I stop observing that, and the behavior is different. Just a few years ago in California, there's a group of um, noetic science, scientists that uh, performed six experiments, and they all concurred with this observation. The photon will behave in a different uh, m um, manner if we have an intention set on that experiment. If we have an intention, then something happens. I really need you to take in, in uh, consideration this because once we are applying a laser beam, we are actually applying hundreds of trillions of uh, photons on the tissue. Something is, has to happen. Why is it that uh, the, our doctors at the clinic that are for the first time treating with, la with a laser compared with in the same machine, compared with other doctor that has been like, uh, used to that treatment, the one that is starting uh, will not have the same results and those amazing results. Because probably he's uh, in doubt. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't have any expectation. All right, it's like a dynamite going off. It's a lot of uh, energy, but it's chaotic. While you have an intention that you are applying some force from getting from A to B, you want something to go to happen. That's how I can explain perfectly how come a group of my doctors are experts. Sometimes the patients will look for them specifically because they know whenever this doctor will do this job, I, I know I'm going to go out perfectly from the clinic. All right. And this is not, it's not a bad, it is not a bad thing to start. We all need to start at some point. Good thing about this particular group is that we all know have uh, this knowledge about how important is the consciousness on what is going on with our photons. Uh, so when we are applying a laser beam, it's like buying half of the numbers of the lottery, right? You have more and more, more and more options that something is going to happen. Uh, light, that's a wavelength, all right? So the wavelength will determine the outcome and the purpose of the use from X-rays to microwaves. Power output will be uh, measured from milliwatts to petawatts. Emission regime 
can be pulsed or continuous. I'd like to talk a little bit about this. If we have a continuous laser emission, it means one ray continuously going on. Pulse meaning, means that somehow, there are different techniques, will be in, in points only, either by separation or by, actually the machine will go off in energy in that moment, but will be pulsed, all right? And now for the classification of lasers. Before this, I'd like to say for, for medical purposes, lasers can be divided in two different uh, groups, all right? One would be the cutting lasers. They are really strong. They go in a really small point, uh, strong enough to cut tissue. When you use a laser for cutting reasons, you will see that there is no bleeding afterwards. So it will heal immediately. It will collapse the vessels. Uh, it will, they, won't, they won't bleed. And the other, for instance, for uh, eye surgery, for general surgery when you want to cut, and the other, the other classification will be therapeutic laser. That's where we want to move, right? Therapeutic laser, also called LLLT, which means low-level laser therapy. Soft lasers, the, all those uh, are talking about the same thing, all right? We are trying to remain in this uh, side, all right? Therapeutic laser. Um, cold laser because it will not, they will not hit at least uh, uh, not uh, the only one that will you will feel hit is in class four. So this classification is because it's uh, considering the probability to cause a eye damage. All right, class one will not produce any uh, damage on your eyes. It, they are really safe. They are, uh, the power is not uh, that big. For instance, for um, CD players, laser printers, those are class one. Then class two, they can cause some harm, but your, the, your eye reflection, the closing of your eyes, well, that will take one fourth of a second, uh, it's enough to take care of that. So at class two, it's really safe. For instance, um, uh, commercial la lasers, scanners, uh, and, some, and now some uh, therapeutic lasers, like the ones that we are going to use now, are class two. Then class three, they will produce some harm. So you need to use glasses, protective glasses. All right, and for class four are also more intense, and you in, they are capable of doing some skin damage. So you need to use uh, glasses, protective glasses, and you need to be really careful when you're applying lasers to dark skin because, uh, because of the color, the skin will uh, absorb that energy and will cause some irritation in that case. All right. Let's say something really general, application of light between 1 to 1500 milliwatts to tissue in order to promote regeneration. What we are talking about in lasers are between 600 and 1,000 nanometers. That's the window that we will use for lasers. Everything that you will buy for a therapeutic laser probably will be, remain, will be in, inside that window, from 600 or a little less to 1,000, a little bit more. Right? Each application from 1 to 10 minutes, we will be talking about this can be applied a few times every other day or every day to a, uh, for a week, for several weeks. This is a question that every time I get, uh, for instance, this is a patient with a, a knee problem or back pain or whatever. The first question they will ask, how, how long will this take to heal? So in order to any disease to appear, you, we need to add some things. For instance, for a cold, right, a cold, we need first viruses. I need to be with my uh, defense system a little bit low. I need, for instance, a cold climate. And I need a uh, mental state. Probably I am a little bit depressed. If I, I am adding up this, then I will be catching a cold, right? But if there's one big event, I do not need anything else. 
If there's a big, really big amount of viruses, I do not need anything else, right? It's, it, it, uh, it, uh, it's going to add up enough to, for me to get a cold. When we are treating, uh, let's say, a back pain, you need to add up some things. One of those things is an emotional aspect. Probably you all know, I've been working a lot. I'm really uh, stressed. I'm worried about money. And I have this amazing, strong, amazingly strong back pain, right? Have you felt that? It's not that you have been lifting things, right? But I have this amazingly strong back, back pain. So there's an emotional aspect here, very, very important. The non-physical aspect here is that important. So whenever we are applying lasers, we are always trying to talk about what is really causing this. All right? Unless this is a, somebody that it's a heavy lifter, some, you know, you don't need any emotional thing right there. But that's not the case in general. In general, you need to find the real cause. So whenever you uh, listen, the, oh, well, I have some histories to tell you. A uh, patient would say, I'm so amazed that you could heal this friend of mine. Only three weeks and she's jogging again. And this one tries to do the same thing. Well, the thing is that it's not the same cause for everybody. I believe that that's the reason that, one of the reasons that the time of treatment will, will vary that much. Anyways, uh, we could uh, say that it is good to do two or three sessions a week, right? And according to the manual of your laser, you will be calculate how many minutes for each point. What I can say is that in my personal experience, probably Vienna also, Dr. Pat, laser will heal. Laser will heal. All right? It, so it was born with an amazing enemy, which is the drug industry. How about that? All right? All right. So. Uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit more about the spectrum of the light. Laser is a light amplification by a stimulated emission of radiation. It's light that with, some, with this tool, it's uh, photons that are simulated. It's a very, very intense and uh, coherent light. And uh, this is a spectrum from 400 to 700, almost 800, there's visible light. All right, if you are starting in 400, then there's uh, blue light. 500, it's green light, then yellow light, then red light. Then it becomes infrared, so we will not be able to see that light. Uh, so whenever we have a, let's say, 900 milliwatt uh, uh, laser, it means that you will not be able to see the light. It is on. The, the laser, it's on, so be careful. Don't uh, aim on your eyes. Well, I'm trying to find if it's on, it is on. So, but we are not be able to, to look at it. In order to work with therapeutic laser, we will be working from 600, all right, to 1,000 or 1,100. That's going to be our window of treatment. We will be working only with 500 and so. You imagine uh, blue laser, yellow or green, with this small equipment for acupuncture, which is probably the best acupuncture we can offer. Uh, it's better than needles because of the, um, in Spanish we can say, a costume, uh, that you can get used to this effect, whatever, all right? That will not happen with light. So if you do acupuncture, I really advise you uh, to get laser pointers, uh, not the point, laser equipment for a specifically designed for acupuncture. So you will be seeing red, yellow, green, and yellow, um, red. Again, blue. Some parameters in general. The power of your machine will be measured in nanometers. Um, Irradiance will be that power that you have on a square, over a square centimeter. 
every time that we measure lasers, uh, we, you need to think about this in square centimeters, not inches, right? Pulse structure that I told you before that uh, the, the laser beam can be sent into one continuous wave, but that's not the case. In general, it is instead pulsed. I need to say this, um, lasers are new somehow, really, really new. So there's no uh, definite book, like a cookbook, what I'm going to do. We are right in the history here. You will know which laser is better, for how long, all right? So in last, um, uh, or, uh, latest works, it seems that it's better, not the continuous wave, but pulsed. It, the pulse are, are, are measured in uh, hertz. Hertz is one pulse over a second. So 500 hertz means 500 pulses in one second, All right? Well, coherence and polarization. Coherence, the laser beam is the most coherent light in nature. Will not go like this, like this. Uh, Bulbs we have here, they can illuminate all around because they are touching surfaces and then going back again and forth. Laser goes like this, it's just one point. But when it touches the surface of your tissue, it will be somehow be polarized when it touches the, the tissue. So we need to take him and die. This, uh, this is very important. I, I think everyone that will work with laser should have this uh, drawing just to remind me, uh, in one joule per square centimeter, we, we will measure the energy of lasers in joules, all right? It seems that when I reach one joule for each square centimeter, then I start having some response from the, from the tissue. It seems that when I have a peak of five or four or five joules, then there's the better response. And then you will be losing that good response. And even some say that if we reach 10 joules for a square centimeter, then they, we will have a harmful effect. I have not seen that. But let's keep in this parameter. All right, so whenever we do our calculations, we will be looking for this, uh, this drawing here. I'd like to say four to even six joules for square. That's, that's the very beautiful point. This is a way to calculate how much energy, meaning, in fact, how many seconds will I be applying my laser, all right? Because once that you start, uh, press the start button, the only thing that you will be controlling is the time, right? You put, put that uh, laser, and then you need to measure how much time. So what we are going to try to figure in with this uh, formula here is how many seconds, all right? Well, what I can tell now, after, let's say, 12 years with uh, laser experience, now every company will give you, like the ones that we will be using, and thank you so much, Robin, I don't know where are you? Uh, well, she, she's landing on the as the lasers. And the parameters are in the cheat sheet that we will be using, all right? For instance, for knee pain, it says uh, this and press, uh, press two and keep there five minutes. We don't need to think about it, just apply here. But we always be applying the lasers with an intention, all right? It really helps me. When I'm doing this, I tell my patient, I absolutely want you to be completely healed. All right? I want that. I'm not just looking and see what's going on or what's going to happen or what face that my patient will show, but I want this. And I don't want to get distracted, so I say the words. All right? Uh, can I have one of the lasers uh, to show you? This uh, particular equipment is, um, has only two buttons. Everything we do requires energy. Everything. Thinking, talking, walking, healing. All right? Everything we do, it will take energy. 
how about if uh, we think about the cell? Do you remember the mitochondria, which manages the ATP, which is energy, all right? Whenever we apply laser to this tissue, the only portion that will uh, use uh, laser energy in the cell is the mitochondria. So it's you giving energy to the mitochondria. In order to, uh, the mitochondria will give the energy to the nucleus, and the cell will do what it knows to do. We are not inventing anything. We are giving energy to the cell to allow the cell to do what it knows what. All right? So uh, in that sense, I can, I have experienced lasers, not only for pain management, which is the, 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 the point of our uh, presentation now, but how about snoring? How about hearing of uh, uh, hearing tinnitus, but also absolutely loss of hearing? How about loss of uh, voice? Shaking hands, you name it. Because if we can reach the cells that we're supposed to do that job, we're done. All right? So in order to work with this, uh, I like this uh, machine. I've been uh, reading about this one. It, this will um, uh, simultaneously give three different wavelengths at the same time. So I like the idea. Well, it has only two, two buttons here, on and off to uh, turn it on. You press and hold for a few seconds. To turn it off, press and hold for a few seconds. Then you have the mode, and that's it. For mode, you, you have five hertz, tuck, 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 five uh, hits on one second, or 50 hertz, and the third one is between 1,000 and 2,000 hertz. We can think about it. Five hertz for a really deep tissue. How about back pain, but it's the nerve inside, all right? 50 hertz when you want to work with an, uh, not that deep tissue, and the really high frequency when you want to work with uh, very superficial. How about for skin? Whenever you see laser, we'll take care of, uh, for cosmetic reasons, it works. Absolutely. All right? Uh, the same uh, program for, for instance, uh, nerve, tri trigeminal uh, neuralgia. It is a nerve that is going really, really superficial. You want to work with that. All right? So for this one, on and off, then you select which of these three modes. And for starting, you just press the first one. For turning on, press and hold. Turning off, press and hold. But to start, just one quick press. Right? I, I'm sure that L, every manufacturer now will tell you how many minutes you will work in every different situation. This is a drawing with a continuous wave, the one of the left. And the other one should be the pulsed. So that's a 50%. Only 50% of the time you will have actually laser beam. And in, in this case, uh, three or four hertz a second. Well, photobiology is in order to, for visible light, have any effect on a living organ, the photons must be absorbed by molecular chromophores. The color is so important. What's color actually how uh, my eye can react to the refle reflection of light. So hemoglobin in the human body and chromophyll in plants are an example of this. In human tissue, there are other chromophores in myoglobin and within the mitochondria, the cytochrome C oxidase. The name comes because it, it can cytochrome. Why is it cytochrome? Because it's colored within the mitochrome. So that's the only part of the cell that will be working with the laser. There are seven... Uh, uh, several ways that a laser can work within the cell. Probably the most important for us is how it works, how we'll produce more and more ATP, which is energy. Oh, I always say, I know that I'm already one minute late. I, I 
uh, say, for instance, light, the sun of light will touch a plant, all right? This plant, because of the light of the photons, will convert energy into matter. So you see this uh, tree growing, right? Then eventually you will eat that apple, yes? After chewing and something going on in the stomach, the liver will absorb this apple and it will distribute the energy. You will not see little apples in our blood flow, right? But energy. So that energy from light became again energy within me. So light, it is that important when we work with laser. It's light for energy. Uh, nitric oxide, oxide uh, associated with uh, uh, vasodilatation, meaning better uh, blood flow. Whenever we are treating inflammation, we need to treat blood flow, flow and uh, uh, this is nitric oxide. And then again, the classification of last lasers. Uh, for if you want to work, uh, I know that with uh, the title that the university gives, plus the knowledge you, are, you will get here with, uh, for working with lasers, and if you get a class two laser, you can work all over the country, right? I did that, uh, that uh, survey, and I know for sure that in the States, you can work with uh, class two lasers all over the place. And class three and four with in, in a few states. I have the list that I sent to Cynthia, I think. So if you want to work with laser for class three or four, you need to check how are the low regulations in your state. But I, I mean it. I, I worked with class two for a long time, probably nine, eight, at least eight years before getting the big machines. And I have seen miracles with that one. All right, so it's not the brand or the, the power, it's actually the conscience that it's working there. All right. Well, this is um, one for the TQ Solo, which is this one. I, again, want to thank uh, uh, Robin for helping us with this. Vienna will be explaining how we will be working with lasers and, and with the other modalities. And, uh, of course, dear, dear ones, uh, we can work everything, most, most everything with lasers. Now we need to open our minds to this amazing thing that's light becoming a wave or particle, right? <laughs> Every day we see that. So thank goodness for that. And I do have my reference and, and everything. So uh, I know that I have uh, shrinked a little bit too much, this. But uh, I am constricted by time. Anyways, I really thank you for, for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in addition to Dr. Mario Viscara, I also wanted to introduce on stage the wonderful Dr. Vienna LaFrance. Woo! Woo! Who is also a faculty mentor at Quantum University. So I want to ask everyone, first of all, who has had chronic pain before? Okay, how many of that is related to your spouse? <laughs> Got it, okay. <laughs> well, we're not going to address that here. But um, we all have experienced some chronic pain, or we know someone who has. So I see, I kind of feel a little sluggish energy going on. So let's do a little activity, okay? I mean, I think all of your lunches have kicked in, haven't they? And you need to, like, stand up and move, all right? So we're going to do a little activity. But first of all, I would like a volunteer, a victim. Come on up, okay? What I want you to do is I want you all to stand up, okay? Get off of your chairs. I want you to face that direction. I think that's towards the ocean, right? Okay? So we're going to do this one technique. Well, maybe watch here first before you do that. But we're going to do this one technique that is a really quick technique on how to manage pain, but also neurological conditions as well, OK? It's a very simple technique that, oh my gosh, you're going to feel so great when you do this, OK? So the technique is you create two fingers like a peace sign, OK? 
And what we're going to do is we're going to stroke the spine in front of the person that's in front of you, okay? But what you're going to do first is listen, Lisan, please, <laughs> is you're going to start at the cervical spine. So we're going to start at the cervical spine, and you're going to stroke all the way down till you get down to the lumbar spine. And don't pick your fingers up before you start the next stroke, okay? And you're just going to do, turn just slightly this way. So you're going to stroke and then do another stroke, and then do another stroke without leaving contact with the spine, okay? So go ahead and stroke the person in front of you. You're gonna get as good as you got. <laughs> so, and if there are some people who, oh, come on over. Okay, over here, come on, Amy. All right, so here's the demonstration. Start at the cervical spine and stroke all the way down the spine, and as you end here, start the next stroke. It's just a very light stroke down along the vertebral spine. Doesn't that feel lovely? Isn't it, is it giving some people chills? Isn't that lovely? Nice. Oh, well, don't worry. We're going to turn around. So now face the other way. For all those on the other end, now you get to stroke me. <laughs> I'm not getting out of this. So stroke the person in front of you, and you just stroke down the spine. Yes. How does that feel? Isn't this, this is such a simple technique you can do to calm somebody down and to calm their whole central nervous system down. This works so well for neurological deficits as well as for pain. You could do it in a standing position, sitting position, laying position, whatever kind of position is comfortable for the client. Doesn't that feel great? This is called the, it's um, from a rude ROOD technique that is well known for neurological deficits. But if you think about pain, it's neurological because it goes through the whole central nervous system. All right, we could do this all day, but let's have a seat. <laughs> and Thank you, Amy. Is that a good speed? That's like a wonderful speed. Did that feel great or what? Did you, we feel rejuvenated, don't we? I see you guys all sitting up straight now. This is wonderful. Okay, great. So we're going to cover a lot in, ver in a very short time. So I had to come to grips to the fact that we are providing you a tickler of information so that you're going to be interested in gaining more knowledge. So we're going to cover four different modalities in this training alone. So I'm going to go fast. So are you guys ready for your warp speed? Okay, get your thinking caps on because we're going to go quick. But we're also going to practice this in the lab, okay? So all this wonderful hands-on so that you have tons of tools to work with. Okay, so when we talk about pain, one of the things that is very apparent is that chronic pain actually shrinks the brain. There was a Northwestern study con conducted where they identified that the brain shrinks by 11% for every year they're in pain. I know. So all of you who have had pain for six years, <laughs> wah, <laughs> okay. But it's by 1.3 cubic centimeters of gray matter that's lost. So one thing I want you to think about is many of our elderly population who have gone undiagnosed with chronic pain, due to that shrinkage of the brain, are oftentimes being misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's or dementia. If we just resolve their pain, due to the neuroplasticity of the brain, guess what? The gray matter will come back. We just have to identify it. And, and that's the key to everything. So if you think about it, it affects the emotional um, components, the emotional responses, decision-making, and controlling social behavior, which is why sometimes chronic pain is misdiagnosed um, as dementia, because they're demonstrating all of those different characteristics. Now, many of you are probably familiar with the gate um, theory of pain by uh, Melzack. Well, the gate, uh, if you're not, the gate theory of pain is about these small, ner uh, these small fibers that go through the central nervous system. And there's also, or go through this gate. There's also these large fibers that go through the same gate. Those large fibers can stop the small fibers from going through. And then a, a nice neurochemical is released that e either can block or allow that, um, that sensation to go through. Well, 
some of the latest theories out there is the neuromatrix theory. And I think this is extremely profound because what the uh, Melzack, Ronald Melzack, uh, is the founder of the neuromatrix theory. And basically, it's an extension of the gate theory. And it's comprised of these neurosignatures or patterns of nerve impulses in the brain that are generated by a widely distributed neural network called the body self neural matrix. It is facilitated by chronic pain, and there's this output of neural networks in the brain, and it helps to describe the phantom limb phenomenon. And that is where uh, the, the client is experiencing pain when there's no limb there. And it's because the brain is recognizing these neurosignatures that is uh, identifying, saying there should be a limb there, and I'm having pain. And so it's a confusion. And it's completely related to emotion and to sensation. So it's a communication loop between the thalamus and the cortex, and between the cortex and the limbic system. And as we know, that controls a lot of emotion and a lot of... Uh, reaction to that. It uh, disturbs the thalamocortical uh, interaction. It becomes overactive, and it creates heightened emotions. So if you think about chronic pain patients, oftentimes they are told, it's all in your head. And especially we see that a lot with some of the conditions such as fibromyalgia, where um, there's a heightened sensitivity to their pain issue. And, uh, and it's usually related to a, um, a disease process that shouldn't be creating this heightened level of sensory um, distortion. But it's because of this neuromatrix. And so it helps to us to under, understand that chronic pain actually is an emotional component. If we don't address the emotion behind it, then it continues to have an impact. So... Um, it is an integration of the sensory, emotional, and motivational and other cognitive interventions that is causing this neuromatrix. Where they found the neuromatrix to be apparent in the brain is in all of these areas of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex, the frontal, the frontal lobe, the uh, parietal lobe, the sensory motor lobe, the cerebral cortex. So if you think about it, that's a large part of the brain and it's affecting all of those areas. And so there's a reason why our clients aren't getting better with opiates. It's because it's not working. It's not addressing the reason behind the pain issue. So as we were talking about some of those areas, here's your prefrontal cortex. So this is all involved in that neuromatrix. Then we have the frontal cortex. We have the um, parietal lobe. And this is the, um, post uh, the pre-motor pre uh, cortex. And then um, we have the midbrain in here, which is also affected by the uh, neuropain matrix. So it's important that we think about that. That is a whole brain type of intervention and a whole brain type of condition. And so it's why we have to get it under control. Okay? All right. So brain waves. This is where everybody goes, oh, my. Well, eyes going backwards. But when you think about the brain waves, uh, Mario already talked about quite a bit of it. But uh, when we're talking about the delta, oftentimes what we'll see is that um, many of our clients that have pain conditions, there's a, a condition called the default uh, mode network within the brain, where um, there are four resting states within the brain. And it's when they are having activity in that non-resting or in that resting state that we tend to see that the um, default mode network has been activated. Okay, so... Um, oftentimes, you'll see that in an EEG scan, like in the delta mode, you might see two to three standard deviations above normal that is um, identifying that they're having some issues with the brain being too active when it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be sleeping, and yet it's firing and firing and firing. And that's when that default mode network is activated, okay? So you tend to see a lot of our, our clients who may have emotional issues or issues where they haven't resolved the pain psychologically, where that default mode network is, is activated. Okay? In the delta, that's that unconscious mind. That's where we tend to be in that sleep mode. And it's also related to that ability to let it go and to integrate. Okay? 
the theta is related to the limbic in the hippocampus, and it's in that daydreaming and fantasizing and creative in, in intuition. This is also where a lot of healing occurs. So you can actually get some of those theta tones to help with some of the healing. And this is actually a healing state. And then, um, and this is also where in the, you see an increase in the posterior brain indicates that there's healing of the mind and body. So if you do an EEG and you see an increase of activity occurring in the posterior part of the brain, that's when you're um, seeing some healing occurring. So that's amazing. Alpha state, that's uh, related to the thalamus and the cerebral cortex. It's the state of relaxation, peacefulness, and alertness. And it's the bridge from conscious to subconscious. And it's also the preferable state of learning. So when you're teaching your clients on different techniques, getting them into an alpha state would be ideal so that they actually have that nice recall. And then the low alpha indicates anxiety. So if they have a low activity going on, they're having some anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and short-term memory. So when we talk about the sensory motor um, beta, that is um, between the 12 to 15 hertz. And um, when you're talking about that, this is when you're looking at the beta, really fast firing um, waves. And in the sensory motor, that's the 12 to 15 hertz. That's where mental alertness, focused attention toward internal and external um, stimuli is occurring. There's a high activity that may be related to pain conditions, so they're more focused on their pain situation. And you'll see a decreased activity linked to insomnia and a lack of focused attention. So that's where they're drifting. So some of you are in this state. You're drifting. <laughs> so wake up, we're here. And then the beta, which is the 15 to 30 cortex, that's in the neocortex. And the state of mental alertness, ability to think quickly and process information. It's also decreased activity inc indicates a, a decrease in the pain intensity. So as we do these QEEGs, we actually see this in this result. Now, this happened to be one of my um, participants in my study for my dissertation. She was a 35-year-old uh, female with a diagnosis of uh, right neck and shoulder pain due to a detached um, sternoclavicular joint for six years. She used to be a baseball player or softball player and a pitcher, <laughs> so she threw it out of whack. Plus, she's now a hairstylist, so everything is up here. So um, her right shoulder easily becomes dislocated, which results in pain and radiates into the back of the right scapula and down the arm and into the fingers. When we started the study, her um, pain symptoms were, um, she was just managing it through rest and, um, and she wasn't a surgical candidate. But what you see in this is that, um, as you can see, this is your delta, this is your theta from this point over, here's your alpha, Here's your sensory motor from 13 to 15, and then here's your beta, okay? So this is her pre before we did anything. And then this is her post after we got done with doing one uh, treatment or one training of ultrasound over acupuncture points. And what I want you to notice is that we see an increase in activity over her frontal lobe, which is basically um, some of the studies identified that if we see an increase in activity over the lower frequencies, such as in the theta, that that's a state of showing some healing that is occurring. The pain is starting to decrease. So we see an increase of activity in our prefrontal frontal lobe in the FP1 and FP2, which is related to a lot of emotion and related to um, uh, uh, processing that emotion. <clears throat> and then we also see here, over the sensory motor strip, which is this middle section right here, we're seeing some really nice uh, normalization. So let me go back to this. <clears throat> when we're looking at this, green is normal. If we're looking at the blue, that's uh, one to two to three standard deviations below normal. Um, if we look at the red, orange, and yellow, that's starting to go with two to three um, standard deviations above normal, okay? So green is normal. Green is the one we want to get to. Um, and then red is like uh, three standard deviations below. So when we're looking at this, in this section right here, this is the sensory motor strip, which is the C strip, okay? So we look for that to see what's been changing within the sensory motor, which is all about sensation and all about motor function. So when we see a decrease where it's starting to go back into normal, we see we're actually seeing a nice improvement, okay? So that's a really nice thing that we got to see. And then also, <clears throat> 
We also saw that in F7, which is over here, in this section here, we actually see that it is actually uh, three standard deviations above, above normal at F7, which is um, selective attention. That means that she is now um, attending more to what is going on around her versus going into this little fog. And then FP1 and FP2, which is in this section here, is where I was indicating that we've seen a nice increase in the standard deviations, which is that emotional component. And then um, in, so when we see a decrease in the sensory motor section, that means that we've seen a decrease in pain sensation. So that's an amazing thing to think about there. And then um, at 17 um, hertz, we see over here, we see um, uh, two standard deviations above normal in the T3 and T7 section, which is right by the ears, okay? Right there. And that's indi indicative of a decrease in pain intensity and improved cognitive function. Okay, and here it is in the nice little slide as a, as a little reminder for you. Now, this is physical proof that we can make an impact, and this is just with one treatment. Imagine what would happen if we got to see her for longer. And what was nice is this lasted for over six days of pain relief. So, but also what came in with that, with, with what Mario was talking about, is intention. You've got to put a lot of loving intention into all of your treatments with the expectation that you're going to get a good outcome and also have them have that same intention as well. Okay? So... When we look at all of these areas, if we really want to get true pain relief, we have to use the downward causation model, which is actually starting with the bliss body and working our way down, which will then affect the physical body. And when we can incorporate that type of intervention, we're going to see quantum leaps. We're going to see um, all different types of uh, responses occurring as a result of that. So it's important that we do this. Now, switching gears. This is what we're going to be starting to do in our, in our lab, okay? We're going to be doing acupressure or uh, identifying some acupuncture points using tuning forks. You can use it with laser. We're going to show how you can use it with crystals, or at least I'm going to demonstrate up here with crystals because we don't have the crystals with you, um, but also how you can use it with all different types of modalities. It's really what is um, important for the client and what you're comfortable with. So how many of you guys are familiar with acupuncture points? Now, if you've taken any of our classes, you should be very, very familiar with them. <laughs> but um, the best way to, talk, to uh, describe what an acupuncture point is, it's about three millimeters just below the skin. And there are 12 meridians that actually transport energy through the body. And, that, and when I talk about 12 meridians, those are paired meridians that are actually uh, <clears throat> associated with, with the organs within the body. And then there's two extra meridians that actually are, go um, from the um, groin area and move their way up, which is the, um, uh, the conception vessel, thank you, and then the governing, um, governing vessel, which goes the, um, from behind, or gov governing vessel but that goes behind. Um, and basically, they, they uh, transport energy throughout the body on a 24-hour basis. And so, when that meridian is active, like the lung meridian is um, active between 3 and 5 in the morning, that's the best time to receive treatment because it is actively firing, right? I see some, <laughs> I see Tracy going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but that doesn't mean we're going to treat our clients at 3 to 5, because how reasonable is that? Come on in at 3 to 5 in the morning and we'll, we'll do some treatment. It's not. But if we can educate and train our, our, our clients on what to do, then we can make them more powerful in, in overcoming their pain conditions, okay? So um, when does dis-ease occurs is when there's a blockage which, within that meridian system. So the best way I can describe the meridians is think about an underwater uh, or an underground irrigation system. So you have this irrigation system that has these pipes. Under the, under the ground, and they are transporting water from one spigot to another, and that water is then dispersing above the ground, right? So this meridian system is similar to that in that we have these channels that are, tra that are channeling this energy from one um, acupuncture point to another, and it's releasing energy or it's taking energy in. So imagine that we have this 
this little sprinkler system. And we have this pipe that's going from one um, spigot to the next. And there's a clog. There's a, a chi dis, dis, uh, stagnation here, or blood uh, stagnation, and it's blocking the flow of chi. And so then what happens to the, the acupuncture point on this side, if the water's flowing this way, what happens over here? There's, a, there's no energy getting to that point, is there? So there, it causes deficiency. And so uh, what happens with that watering, if we continue with the irrigation system, here's this water going through this pipe, it hits this clog, and this little spigot is not feeding the earth. So then the grass dies, right? So we need to release that clog and create homeostasis. Now, if on the other side, this water's coming through and... Um, What's happening to this acupuncture point? It's getting flooded with all kinds of stuff because all kinds of water. And so then it's going to just spill over all this water and flood the earth. So then therefore it's also going to die because it's getting too much energy. So if you think about that, that's almost like the inflammation state. Too much inflammation is causing all this. And then we have the disuse area where they're not getting enough energy. So if we just release that clog, and get that energy to flow, then we create homeostasis with that, um, that meridian, and we get some nice healing occurring, okay? So that's the best way to kind of identify what, the, what that's about. And it's all about chi, all about energy. There's three categories based on the points, and that is um, the points of meridians are, are there's different, different points that are on the meridian, and they're connected, and they run along the meridian. There's the extra, extraordinary points that are located outside the meridians. And then there's tender points that are tender to the touch when you touch them. And those are the ones that have imbalance or disharmony in the meridians or the organ. So if you have something going on with your kidney, then your kidney meridian is going to be very tender. And there's going to be some points along that meridian that are going to be very tender. You can also locate points through using a voltmeter. And it's similar to uh, when you're testing the electrical components of your house. That's your voltmeter. Well, the same thing goes with the um, acupuncture point because it's energy, if you think about it. So you can actually identify those points using that. Okay? So there are, um, functional, uh, there's a functional MRI that was conducted, a study, that identified that um, acupuncture points deactivate the limbic um, structures, which is the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the cingulate um, cortex, which, if you think about it, that's related to the neocortex or I mean to the neuro, neuro matrix that we just talked about. So acupressure is really good for addressing that neuro matrix theory. Acupressure on local and distal points um, significantly improve conditions in females with chronic pain conditions. These are all studies that were conducted. It also promotes the release of endorphins and kephalons. And then there was a study that showed that large intestine four, which we know is in that web, is actually one of the greatest analgesic points in the body. And it also helps to uh, inhibit nociceptive processing in the brain. Okay, any, so that's about the, um, the acupressure. Now, when we're talking about auricular therapy, we are going to also be doing this in our lab as well. So <clears throat> it was originally um, identified in the um, Chinese with, since the Han Dynasty, all the meridians converge at the ear and is closely related to all points of the body and organs. And it's depicted by an upside-down fetus in the ear. So the ear and the head would be down by the ear lobe, and the um, feet would be up by the top of the ear. And, each, and then there's also the other theory through uh, Noger, which is um, the French version. Dr. Paul Noger uh, also uh, developed a whole strategy with the... Uh, auricular therapy system, and um, I've actually studied under his son, which is uh, Raphael Nager, and um, learned some really great techniques with that. But each part of the auricular uh, corresponds to the specific part of the body or the organ, and there's reflex points that are linked directly to the central nervous system and that are painful to pressure. So we are going to actually locate points on each other based on these protocols, and yes, and actually we're going to apply some seeds to your ear. So this will be going to be really, really fun, all right? And it helps to stimulate um, and produces rebalancing the central nervous system and alleviating some of those pathological conditions. 
Now, the way that uh, Noger identifies the different points is through a painful stimulus. So the idea is that you take a probe, and you guys are all going to share probes at your table, but you take a probe and you actually, um, based on the types of points you're going to locate and uh, where we identify where most of the points are going to be based on the condition we're treating, you're going to um, go through the ear and actually go onto these points and stimulate. And whichever you get a painful response, those are the ones you're going to treat. So on your protocols, you may have like 10 different points, but you may only activate maybe three because not all of them are going to be painful. Also, I'm kind of giving you a little heads up on your lab because when you're going to stimulate the ear points, you're going to start with point zero. And in your handouts, you're going to see where point zero is. And um, when you stimulate point zero, it will bring up all the other reactive points. So it actually kind of stimulates those points so that when you start to locate it, you'll find it, okay? So that's one of the best ways. You can also use the, vo the altimeter to find those points as well because it's extremely important that you get really active location of these points because you might be stimulating a point that they don't need stimulated, okay? So we're going to do that. Um, it's recommended that you only stimulate three to five points for, and with the greater sensitivity or pressure, and it's usually related to the body part that's affected. And um, there's some master points that through uh, laser actually would work really well, as well as through uh, electrical stimulation, those will work really well as well. And then we'll have some formulas that you can use. Um, the pain threshold modulation, um, it's consisted of placing the Vakari seeds over the fingers and at one point of the ear. And so we will actually have these little seed beads that you're going to be using. And you're going to be placing them on the ear. We're actually going to be cleaning these little things before you uh, activate them. I'm getting my little toys out. And um, you're going to be using those with the... Um, and our, our little, uh, our captains are going to be going through this with you. But you also will have a, um, a tweezer that you can actually pull the little Bakari seed from the um, plastic and then place it on the ear. It makes it so much easier to do that than trying to peel it with your fingernails because the tape will stick. Okay, so we're going to place them on the ear. It's recommended that you only treat one ear at a time. Um, and you do the ipsilateral side. So if you have pain on the right shoulder, you're going to treat the right, shoulder, the right ear, okay? But if you're tr um, trying to treat both sides of the body because they have bilateral pain, then use both sides. The reason why it's usually recommended only one is because of the fact that if you treat both, then sometimes it's really hard for them to sleep <laughs> because they got this, they're all constantly being stimulated when they sleep on that one ear. And then also, you want to give the other ear time to recover from wearing the beads, the seats. Okay, so that's one, one thing to think about. Okay, so we're gonna go into that. Now, vibrational medicine. We're gonna talk about tuning forks. How many of you guys have used tuning forks? Are you excited? We're gonna have some fun with these. So, it was invented in the 18th century. Uh, originally, it was for medical field testing of hearing and um, used to, uh, for music devices and stuff like that. And, but now it's becoming much more prevalent. So we're using these healing um, sounds to help with uh, healing and getting the energy to flow through, as well as just energetically. So the idea is that we have these different hertz that vibrate within the body, and the vibration will either get the blood flow going or to get the whole lymphatic system going or get the chakra system to get activated. It really depends on what you're using. So we have, and I'm going to go through these really quick because you guys will have these slides. So vibration, it's about solid matter. It does not exist. So we want to get the um, senses to perceive a higher density as molecules as solid. And each atom is um, a number of spinning electrons that forms the elements that, considered are, that are made of. And it's in constant motion. So when we use vibration, we get that whole system to be moving. Okay. Now, how many of you guys have heard of entrainment? Okay, so it is when you have two vibrating forces that when you bring it together, they become one, okay? So the whole idea is that we want to create an entrainment that is occurring in the system to create this external rhythm and an internal rhythm as well, okay? So getting the tuning forks to work is going to cause this entrainment to occur. 
And um, oftentimes you'll see entrainment occurring with music. So this happens a lot with dementia. You can actually use music with dementia clients to actually um, get them to um, start to vibrate and to start to participate and their brain starts to activate. And it's an amazing thing when you use it. And a lot of times it's using music from their past. Okay. So they work together. And that's the whole idea. There's a difference between weighted and unweighted. This is a weighted kind because it has the weights on the end, and this is the unweighted. The weighted you're going to use with different types of pain conditions, and we're going to be, um, you activate it. Usually you have a little activator on your leg, but I usually use, use my gallbladder 34 here, and I just tap it. And then you use this, you're holding the stem, and then you're placing it onto the acupuncture point or onto the um, place of pain, or you can actually use it on different types of meridians and so on, okay? So that's one area that you can do it with. Then there's also, this is the unweighted kind, where you tap it, and you can use it on the ears or in the chakra system or the whole energetics, okay? So you're going to have both of these types of devices, or you're going to have one device at each of the tables, but you're going to have one of these at your table to practice. And we're going to use these on your acupuncture points or also on your um, different types of uh, painful areas. Okay. Now, there are different types of hertz. The 128 hertz is actually really good for pain management, muscle spasms and circulation. 64 hertz is really good for lower lumbar vertebrae, um, the sacral and the coccyx. You can put it right on that bone, and you can actually get that nice stimulation going through there. And then 32 hertz is used for near the skin to generate and stimulate nerves. And then we have the 136.1 hertz, which is a grounding and soothing and creates some nice relaxation. Then we also have the Pythag Pythagorean um, types of tuning forks, which is actually helps to reproduce or re reproportion the body through cellular memory. And they're on different types of octaves. We are going to be using the C octave with us today. And then Lumerian is ones that you're going to use to really uh, bring out that um, uh, higher levels of consciousness and also helps to formulate some sonic merkaba. So that uh, can actually help with some of the meditations that you're going to be doing later in your life. Okay? These, are the area, these are all the different types of conditions that you can use to treat uh, chronic pain with the tuning forks. Okay. Now, how many of you guys have heard of emotional freedom technique? How many of you guys use it with your clients? Awesome. Now, if you think about emotional freedom, it actually incorporates the whole downward causation that we're talking about. Because you have to talk about the emotional and the psychological, correct? So it's important that we incorporate the emotional freedom technique. And um, we're going to actually go through that during your lab. There's several different types of techniques out that are out there. I'm using the one based off our quantum medicine model, our new quantum medicine, um, which is using different types of tapping techniques. But there's also some other ones out there. And we're going to use those. We're actually going to walk you through how to do it. You're going to create your own negative statement, and you're going to tap, tap, tap all the way through. But if you think about it, the emotional freedom technique actually uses acupressure points while you're identifying the emotional and the psychological issues that are occurring. And that's the key component of it, is that we have to address that. Because if we don't, they're constantly going to be in pain. So incorporating this type of technique in all of your different types of interventions and with your clients is going to be extremely important because it does release that. So it's used by about 8 million people out there. So that's pretty, pretty profound. And it helps to rewrite their subconscious and their conscious and their energetics and chemical flight or flight response. Because if you think about a lot of our chronic pain patients, they are constantly in this fight or flight response because they're in constant pain. And so they're constantly thinking, I need to take care of this. So it's important that we incorporate this into it. And oftentimes, it'll bring up some of those past things that they haven't resolved and that is actually causing a root cause of their pain. Okay? So it affects the limbic system, um, source of emotions, long-term memory, negative experiences are encoded. Um, it affects the amygdala, which is that flight or flight response. And tapping deactivates the brain arousal pathway. And also tapping on the meridian acupuncture points, which is what all of these tapping um, locations are, are acupuncture points. And it reduces the cortisol level by 24 to 50%. Okay? 
So the, um, this is the technique we're going to go through. Okay. So first of all, you identify the problem. Is it pain, stress, anger, anxiety, money issues, spousal issues, <laughs> children, whatever. And then you're going to be specific. Create one problem at a time and address it. And you're going to create a negative statement. Now, a lot of people ask, why create a negative? Aren't we supposed to be positive? Aren't we supposed to always think about what's, what's a positive thing? No, because you want to address the negative because that's what's affecting you. That's what's holding you back from healing. Okay, so bring it out in the open, identify it. And when you're creating that negative statement, you're going to create it by using um, three different ideas. And that is, first of all, identify what it is. Is it pain, anxiety, what is it? What emotion is behind it? And then um, how is it affecting you? Okay, so you're going to score your level of uh, subjective units of distress, which is your SUDS level, on a 0 to 10 scale. So how severe is this at this point? And then you're going to start doing this nice little, okay, so our um, new quantum medicine course, we talk about it in uh, where the sore spot, which many of you might see it as the, uh, the karate point chop, or karate point, <laughs> karate chop point. Um, a lot of you will see it this way, but in the sore spot is when, you're is when you're talking about your negative statement. So an example of your negative statement was, even though I have this uh, excruciating back pain that it causes me emotional stress and disorder. I love and respect myself. And you keep rubbing that spot. Okay, and then we start through the sequence. And the sequence is you start um, in some other different techniques. You might start at the top of the head and you're tapping five to seven times as you're creating this uh, reminder statement. And the reminder statement is I have this back pain. I have this back pain. So you guys can start doing the tapping with me. I have, and create your own little statement. I have this back pain. I have this back pain. I have this excruciating pain. It's limiting me. It's uh, causing this discourse. Um, it's uh, creating some problems in my life. It's creating problems in my life, creating problems in life. And you just keep, keep going through this sequence until you decrease it down to zero. Your set scale is to zero. Okay? So you could be tapping for a while. <laughs> now, this could also be related to weight loss. Because we've seen a lot of that with that too, okay? So there's a lot of things you can do with that. So last is we're going to talk about the electrical stimulation unit we're going to be using, which um, is a phenomenal um, device because this is the one and only device that actually has a pattern electrical nerve stimulation in it as well as a TENS unit in it. So And it's very easy to use. It's actually designed for... Uh, um, for our um, clients to take home and utilize, okay? And uh, because it has a PENS and a TENS in it, the PENS tends to be for neurological deficits when we're trying to uh, reteach the body to uh, fire new nerve patterns and so on. The TENS unit is for pain issues. We're gonna practice the TENS unit today. And there's three different protocols within this device for TENS. There's the motor, there's the sensory, and there's the motor sensory. It's based on a, a medium frequency alternating current type of um, a waveform. It passes through the skin to the nerves. So we're actually gonna apply some electrodes. You're actually gonna be able to feel these uh, different types of um, uh, pulses. We're actually gonna get to a nice uh, muscle contraction to actually get that pain under control. We're gonna put it over acupuncture points. You can put it over painful areas of, um, of discomfort. And um, we're gonna actually start running that protocol as well. Now, uh, the beautiful thing about it is it, uh, it's actually really good because, uh, because of the fact that you have, you can actually program this to have two different programs going once you finish one. So let's say that we wanna do pain relief and then we wanna do some motor relearning. You can actually program this to do a TENS and a PENS, after, one after the next. So it goes right into it. You program it as a clinician, and then the client takes it home and they can apply it to themselves. I have one last thing that I want to talk about, and that is another way in which we can address acupuncture um, pain and acupuncture points is using crystals. Now, we're not going to practice this in the lab because of the fact that um, we didn't bring the crystals, but I want you to realize that there's other alternatives that you can actually address the acupuncture points. And that is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these crystals that we had last year that has the 
sacred geometry on it. But the idea is that you hold the crystal in your, right, in your left hand, which is your receiving hand, the receiving hand of energy, right? And then you take this other crystal, and you can actually uh, apply acupuncture or acupressure using this crystal. And um, you can actually put a homeopathic on here. And this is actually really good. If you guys have watched the Taoist medicine course, how many of you guys have watched the, the Taoist medicine? All right, so we're talking about quas and some of the marvelous vessels, right? So you can actually use this device to also help with some of those, uh, treating those conditions, right? So, I should have unwrapped this beforehand. So the idea is that you're holding onto the crystal with one hand. You can actually use a homeopathic on the point that you're trying to treat. And then, so you apply the homeopathic there. And then you take your crystal and you apply it right on that point. And you can actually create a really good um, intervention by getting the energy to flow into that point and release those neurochemicals. And because the skin is extremely receptive to whatever we're applying on it, it'll work really well. Okay, so lots of different ways in which we can address chronic pain. Are you ready to take your health and wellness career to the next level? Have you always dreamed of having a career in natural medicine? Do you need to expand and protect your professional health practice with proper credentials? Then take the next step and start an exciting, successful and meaningful career by enrolling in an online degree program in natural and integrative medicine at Quantum University.